Cool Hand Podcast, something you got to deal with. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host. My name is Q. I am accidentally matching uh, with my guest today. Uh, this was not planned, but I would like to say great minds think alike, but I listen to this sister's podcast and she's way smarter than me <laughs> and more insightful than myself. So I would think it would be an insult to say great minds think alike. But anyway, guest, please introduce yourself. Hello, I am Zaharia. I am um, from the DMV area. I do photography, art, and like everything else under the sun, podcasting. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We're gonna. We. I, I need to get to know all of the things that you do. Everything that uh, Zaharia does. So thank you for being on the show. Um, where are you? Where do you live? Yeah, a lot of time when I say the DMV, people assume Virginia, but I am not at all from Virginia. I'm from Maryland, and I'm from Laurel, Maryland, which is like, the best way I can describe it is I'm 30 minutes from D.C. and I'm 30 minutes from Baltimore. So I'm like the suburbs of the two cities in Maryland. Interesting. Okay. So I have I have very little experience with the DMV. I've been down there a couple times. Um for a concert and then a wedding in Maryland, but uh, the concerts were in D.C. So what what is it like or what was it like growing up in, did you say Laurel? Um, Laurel is heavily influenced by both cities, um, D.C. and um, Baltimore. And so I feel like as I've gotten older, I didn't really recognize this growing up because, you know, you kind of take things for granted. You just go with the flow. But um I didn't recognize how big of an influence that two city cultures had on my experience growing up, Um, music wise, even to how you dress. Um, So I grew up listening to a lot of like um, DMV music, uh, DMV rap, um, Baltimore music, Baltimore house, and um, I've always loved house music just because my parents introduced it. But like I'm recognizing now, I think I can't remember who I was talking to, but um, I was like talking about how I enjoy like, you know, mixing house songs. And they're like, where are you from? And I was like, oh, well, I'm from Maryland. And she was like, oh, that Baltimore definitely influenced your like love of house music. So like we have so much culture here it's chocolate city it's a lot of black people um and so i think that influenced just a lot of the things that i i like today um but it also can be very you know people are like what they're of and sometimes they don't want to deviate out of that and that can kind of stunt your growth um, if you don't see past it. So it's a lot of people that are just, you know, kind of doing the same thing. Um, brands are a big thing out here. People have a lot of brands. I see you wearing my homeboy brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Curtis. That's my OG. Um, but yeah, a lot of people... That's like kind of the culture here. It's music and fashion is like really heavy here. Um, And it's a big deal. More of a big deal than I recognize because I just I would walk around like, oh, like this is like everywhere. Everywhere is like this. It's not the case. (laughs) Interesting. Okay, so. All right. So DMV. So when you say like DMV artists, DMV rappers, can you give me an example of who might be a DMV rapper? Okay, so I feel like during like 2017, 2018, there was like that Spinrilla era. I don't know if that's outside the DMV, but like Spinrilla rappers were like, um, you had like Swipey, Light Show, Shabazz, Cutiful. Cutiful has the DMV national anthem, Guns and Bells. You go to any DMV party, you're gonna hear that song. Interesting. Um, 
I love that song. Like I can I it's like it's literally like the national anthem. Like I can recite <laughs> it in my sleep. It's real wow. bad. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, who else? Gold Link. Mm-hmm. You know, Gold Link has become really big. Him and Brent when they made Crew, and like, what was that? 2018. I don't want to get. I don't want. I remember my wife and I were still dating when that song was huge, and we got married in 2018. So this had to be like 2016, 17. Okay. But I want to say, I want to interject because when you mentioned the Spinrilla era rappers, now I only heard of Spinrilla, never used it. I couldn't tell you if it was a website or an app. I'm aging myself. But um, I never heard of any of those except Q to Fool, and I don't know any of his music. So um, I'm, I don't know if I'm just out of touch or I'm just, I'm just a Pittsburgh dude who's not from the DMV. One of the two. Yeah, I think it's that because it it was definitely like a local thing. Like, I'm trying to think there's something. Did y'all have um, The Quiet Storm, that radio? Did y'all get that? No? I think like our hip hop and R&B station did like a Quiet Storm thing, but it was like a local thing. So, mm. okay. Because I was asking, I think, okay, I was actually asking Sonny about that, like a few and I think he said yes. So I didn't know if it was like a regional thing, like it got to a certain state or mm-hmm. if it was just a DMV thing. Cause I had other people say like, no, I yeah. don't know about that. But that was a radio station. Like, well, not a radio station, like a segment. And it was like, um, I just remember that very distinctly. And I didn't know if that was like, a DMV thing or a regional mm-hmm. thing. I don't know. But like, I just think that's very cool. You know, we yeah. have our own. <clears throat> you got your own yeah. thing. And I, I want to know about the house music as well. What house music artists um, does the DMV listen to or just you in general that you like to listen to? Um. Okay. So I don't think house music is a DMV thing, but uh, more so a Baltimore thing. Um, now, Baltimore is very much its own place. Like, it's not even a part of the DMV. They have their own, they're, they might as well be their own state, okay? <laughs> um, but Baltimore house music is a lot like, you know, Philly, Jersey, that they're all those cities kind of like, for me, they kind of like come together when it comes to house music. That, um, I don't know what the beat is, but yeah, like, you know, the, like the repping of the hoods and stuff like that, like that type of house music, got you club music, that, that's what that sounds like. Gotcha. But um, for me growing up with parents, okay, so my mother's from Pittsburgh. That's right. But, and I think I told you that. Yes. Um, <laughs> But she didn't stay there, like, too long. After she got grown, she was like... <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I can't really say for sure um, that her music was influenced from Pittsburgh, per se, but more so, like, when she got out. And then my father's from New York. He's from Brooklyn, New York. Um, that's where he was, like, raised. And so that, like, you know, the club scene, that type of house music... And then they both really like, they're both house heads. So that's where a lot of my house music love comes from. And they didn't just stay in their regions. Like you have Chicago house, like, you know, you have all those regional house music. And um, I'm trying to think like, love Crystal Waters. She's a queen. Okay. Um, I have a whole house playlist. I feel like I have to look it up. Yeah. You'll you'll have to you'll have to share it with with the people um, just so people can, you know, get to know you even after the episode. We can put that out. um, Just some Zaharia recommendations. So, okay, so we're learning a lot. And for context, also, um, we uh, Zaharia and myself also met down in Atlanta. Um, Today is the first of 2024, but uh, maybe like almost a month ago, uh, we got to see each other at the Castier 
uh, pop up shop, Castier Zoom and Live, excuse me, pop up shop um, down there in Atlanta. So, um, you know, the pop up shops bring people together. <laughs> uh, right. I remember them, uh, I think Dev specifically talking about building like community with like the pop up shops. And I think this contributes having, you know, interactions like this uh, contribute to that, uh, that whole community thing that he was talking about. So, <sighs> Laurel, house music. Your parents were into the house music. It got trickled down to their offspring. So you are a creative person, to say the least. Um, I know one of the things that you recently completed was like a 30-day straight content posting thing. Can you kind of break that down um, of what you accomplished and what you learned from that? Yeah, I feel like I learned more than accomplished and maybe that is an accomplishment in itself but um so I kind of I've always enjoyed like watching people's content creating content but I think that I really wanted to narrow down to a niche and um that's something I have a hard time doing um because I do that's what I want and I do know that like for me, Instagram has always been like, almost like, it's never been for anybody else but me. Like, it's always been a form of my self-expression and putting my life out there. I know that it seems like I put a lot of my life out there, but it's literally only like 18% at the most. Because it's, you know, it is places that I go and things that I see, but it's really like the eye for me. It's a design thing. Like, if I see anything that could possibly contribute to expressing my character or myself, like I want to put it out there. So I say all that to say, I wanted to narrow that down because like I told you earlier, like not a lot of people know some of the endeavors that I have um, creative wise. And I kind of wanted to narrow that down. So I took that time to explore just like the consistency of creating content um, in itself. And then also um, like being able to, I guess in a sense, prove it to myself that I can do this. Okay, like I can do this. And what I learned from that is that um, quality really matters to me. Um, not just like posting because I have to, but making sure the quality um, reflects like what I want to portray, even if it comes in a form of chaos, like there's still quality behind it. And um, also recognizing that like, yes, I'm doing this for myself, but also I'm trying to reach a community of people that look like me. So being able to cater to that, um, and like kind of figuring that out. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, and you do have, um, I guess like an aesthetically pleasing Instagram. Now you have multiple pages and I, you know, I can't keep up. I can't Please. keep up, so. <laughs> I know, it's the ADHD, it's all over the place. <laughs> well, I, I, follow, I follow one. I feel like you use this account often. So it, it has like a good, you know, you can look at a page and see like, you know, it just looks aesthetically pleasing. It doesn't look all jumbled up, a bunch of random stuff. It kind of, you know, everything gels into the next post. Um, whether it's like I see something with a quote here uh, to like a Pinterest board type thing to looks like a beef patty, but they all kind of gel into each other um, in a way that it just doesn't look unorganized or disorganized now you mentioned on your podcast before and you just mentioned it now you have adhd yes i do okay so do you mind talking about that a little bit sure i don't mind um so i actually was diagnosed with adhd like as an adult okay and so i don't know how i got through school but school was definitely hard for me um and now I know why it was hard for me, but I am like appreciative for to be able to have a diagnosis so that I can navigate life a little bit easier or with like that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think a lot of times people think ADHD is just you're hyperactive, but it's really your brain is hyperactive. Like your brain is moving at a mile a minute. Like, and I think, I mean, I feel like you could see that <laughs> from me. Like I don't really hide it well. Um, but um, I mean, I think it's it's put a lot in perspective for me. Also, I think, you know, being a Black woman, a lot of times, um, just, I mean, one, being a woman is a tear of it because a lot of times um, they diagnose men and boys with ADHD more than, I don't know a statistic or a number, so I'm not going to say <laughs> anything. Um, and then being Black, you know, we don't do too well with diagnosis when it comes to mental health, but I'm grateful to have a supportive family. Um, my mother was the one who actually brought it out and was like, you know, I have a coworker. She deals with the same things you do. I think that she should look into it. And so earlier this year, um, mm -hmm. I like really, like I really took it seriously. And it's helped so much. Like I've gotten the help and therapy that I needed. And um, I don't know. At first I thought I was going to be like, oh no, it's going to take away my creativity. <laughs> if I adjust this. <laughs> but it's the, it's the opposite. It's more of an awareness. And I feel like, I feel like my algorithm be listening to me. <laughs> and I'll see a lot of people with the same experiences as me. And a lot of creative people, like there's a, there's like a tie between the two. So that makes me feel even better about it. But um, yeah, I mean, it is who I am. And um, I kind of like, maybe I joke about it a little bit too much, but it's kind of like an awareness, not just like to everybody else, but to myself, like, okay, this is yeah. where we are, you know? Yeah. I uh, thank you for speaking on that because um <laughs> I joke you know black people don't go to the doctor um <laughs> it, it is a real thing because if you have issues and are reluctant to seek help you're just going to deal with the issues for the rest of your life and um and the thing is I used to work at a doctor's office um a few years ago and to see the amount of adults that did have to be prescribed Adderall or methylphenidate, methylphenidate for um, ADHD. Um, it's it's just not uncommon. Then another thing, um, as, just as a side note for anybody who may be watching, everybody's on antidepressants. By the way, this is just from my experience working at yes. the doctor's <laughs> office. I was surprised. I'm like, okay, they're on they're on antidepressants. They're on antidepressants. Everybody was on antidepressants. So just a heads up. Don't feel. For everybody, this isn't for just you. Don't feel weird because everybody's on them. So, um, yeah. So, thank you for sharing that experience. How you know you kind of touched on it, but how has uh, life changed for the uh, for your benefit since getting your diagnosis? I also have a few other things going on, and I feel like being able to address that has made me more like aware. Um. I think there are certain things that we don't recognize are um, proving to be like in it, like inhibiting to us. Um, and we just think like, oh, the person is lazy or the person is just not good at adulting. And that's how I felt for a very long time. But it has like not just like because there is but so much that you can do. Um in a short period of time with information that you have. But with with knowledge is power, like I always say this knowledge is power. And with knowledge, like gives a different perspective. And that perspective has allowed me to be a little bit easier on myself. Um and others, honestly, because sometimes when you have an expectation of yourself, you expect everybody else to be like, what are y'all doing? Like, come on, mm -hmm. we got to hustle. Right. And right. it's not always about hustling. Sometimes it's about 
enjoying the moment. Um, I'm very much a hustle type girl. Um, And I think pushing myself past what I could even handle really was detrimental to my mental health and being able to address and be aware um, allowed me to like, you know, really take my time. Uh, And time is so important. Like time is so important, especially with art. Um, Rushing through art is never good. (laughs) So time is so important and it's giving me, it's giving me back a lot of time um, to just like be in the moment and not be overly anxious about tomorrow or a few hours or the next month so yeah thank you for sharing that um you offered a a lot of good things that kind of segue into uh what i want to talk about next because um you said you know being you know good at adulting or you know someone having the perceived ability to be good at this adult life and you have a podcast which uh, kind of speaks on adult life. Um, I guess you really become an adult after you graduate high school. I think that's the American idea. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and you have a podcast, which is called Something About Your 20s. Did I get that correct? Okay. Yes. And I listened to every single episode. And <laughs> don't give me any credit if you haven't listened because there's only so many. But yeah. what I listened to, I liked a lot. Um, So can you tell us about your podcast and how that got started? Okay, so um, I guess I should put out there that I'm only 20. um, And I'll be 21 in two months. So I'm going to be a real adult. But (laughs) um, I I feel like I needed to create a space um, for people like me. And not just like me, but also completely opposite of me um, to be able to um, kind of have a space to like vent about how ghetto it is out here. Like it's very (laughs) ghetto. Like conversations I've had have been so beautiful and refreshing. Like it's never been super negative. Like and I think in my my head, I was like, oh, yeah, we about to talk about how bad it is out here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's never been that. Like, it's always been super encouraging by the end. And um, I think my biggest thing as well, being a creative, is I don't think a lot of creatives talk about their process. And so... A process is not just, like, a process for a piece, but a process for, like, your growth and maturity and different things that influence where you are now. Or even talking about, like, success and, um, or even bridging the gap. Like, it's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I talk about, um, like, bridging the gap between, um, childhood and adulthood I feel like we don't talk about that enough and how impactful our childhood selves and our like a lot of people speak about your inner child has on your adult self and so I wanted to speak about that as well um I think also coming out of the pandemic I didn't have a lot of resources that and I hate to use that like it as an excuse but it's a reality um a lot of the resources and experiences um, that people older than me have had. So I wanted to, you know, create a space for people that are going through the same thing as me, but also like I found a lot of great wisdom and advice from like people that are older than me um, who are at different places within their own, you know, journey of their 20s. So it's been a cool experience. I haven't been 100% consistent because life, life be life in, but I feel like from the podcast episodes of last year, like I learned a lot 
and um yeah absolutely so yeah um just as a you know as a plug you know go listen to the podcast everybody because i do think as a old man a 30 year old myself i found value within the podcast like it was not um it wasn't superficial it was it had a lot of depth to it i did like the con the conversation uh so i think i really think you got a good thing going i um <laughs> I, I want you to keep going because uh i think you have a you have something good with that podcast so um just as an example um you did talk about the pandemic i remember you had two brothers on there talking about um life within the pandemic you talked about um bridging the gap and then you had an episode that i i listened to twice it was the shorter one and i think it was your most recent episode and it was kind of like self-reflective um and so just moving forward can we if you can because life be life and as you know as uh, uh, someone who is living life myself, I get it. So, uh, do you have any plans on resuming the podcast, starting it back up? Anything that you can uh, reveal? Yeah, I actually, um, I'm going to record with a few people this week. Um, but I'm going to try to do, I, I feel like last time, I was putting too much on my plate with like posting every Friday. It was overwhelming for me. And so I think I'm going to try once a month. And if I get that down, we'll go to twice a month. My biggest thing is like scheduling and planning and reaching out, which are things that I didn't have super strong skills in last year, but have become stronger. Like my networking has become so much better. Um, so. I think that that makes me a little bit more hopeful for a consistent podcast. But it, if not twice, definitely once a month, um, I want to drop an episode. That sounds like a good idea. Um, I would appreciate it. And if I would appreciate it, then I always think there has to be some at least one or two people out there like myself. So if I appreciate it, somebody else will appreciate it. So looking forward to the next episode dropping um, your podcast gets the cool hand stamp of approval. So um, thank I'm you. Looking, absolutely. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, what you got coming next. Um, so something about your 20s podcast. Go check it out. Now you do some more things. You are um, just at such a young age, you got, you got a lot going on creatively. So, <laughs> yeah. um, let's, let's move on to the, the most recent thing, um, that I learned about you, which is photography. And I think I learned about this through you posting another one of your Instagram pages. I'm like, what am I missing? Because this is the thing I'm like, I want to do at least. I want to do my due diligence in researching the person I'm going to um, interview. So I'm like, oh, oh, crap. Like, I got something else to look at. So um, let's talk about <laughs> photography. How would you get into it? Um, okay. So I got into photography. I have to shout out to my man's Q. His name is actually Quentin, too. And he lives in Charlotte. And he was doing, like, he was just doing, like, point-and-shoot film. Oh, also, I feel like there are a few people, my friend Q, and then my friend Max, he like, uh, looking at his, he does, he does like uh, 120 millimeter film. And then my other homeboy, he does like 35 millimeter film and then Sunny as well. So I feel like a lot of those dudes, like watching them do film, um, was like really like oh my gosh I want this is something I want to do, um, <clears throat> so I think that was like inspiration to me. So I got my first film camera in twenty twenty two, and my first shoot was a like picnic that I had. It was not the best, but it it was definitely like you know I was really excited, and I I think. Um, my growth from that has like been so amazing um but that's the first i i got a like a night it's over there 
it's like a Nikon tele something. I don't know. Um, and then I upgraded to a uh, an SLR. Um, when I did my recent first uh, like professional paid photo shoot, I I shot a graduation um, like photo shoot. That was also a learning lesson, um, but that was also very fun. So a lot of inspiration, um, but I only shoot film. I don't do digital. And I think I, I'm very into nostalgic and timeless and quality things. Like that's just my thing across the board for everything that I do and invest in. And so, um, yeah, like I've stuck with it for the past, it's almost two years, just about. And um, yeah, it's been a super exciting journey. I've learned so much. Yeah. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that, because um, with all the photographers that I've interviewed on here, I know that it's uh, there's a huge learning curve because um, photography is it, it's just a whole nother field that requires a lot. And uh, shout out to uh, Q, Max, Sonny, um, Quentin. That's that's my brother, because we spell our names the same way. So shout out to Q down there in Charlotte. So um <clears throat> What was it like? Because also your interest in photography, what made you want to pick up a camera? You did have the influence. So was it just like from seeing other people use film cameras that made you think, okay, I can pick this up or was there something else? I think it was also like just something new. Um, it was something new. And then back again to like the quality, like, um, man you know the kitchen table series um sorry Carrie... no. no oh okay well okay so and uh, like i feel like i'm gonna have all my facts wrong um but okay so i'll just say what i know for sure um in the 90s there's this artist who did the kitchen table series i don't know if you can find her name um i definitely is it I Carrie Mae Carrie... Weems? Yes. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yes, yes. That I saw that in the National Portrait Gallery, which is one of my favorite places to go in DC. And just to see like how she told a story, like I am huge when it comes to storytelling. And I wanted to be able to do that with a camera. Oh wait, let me go back. Mm -hmm. My first shoot was not the picnic. It was with my little brother. I did a pity party shoot with my little brother. That's on my, like, uh, my portfolio and everything. But, mm -hmm. yeah, like, I really wanted to be able to tell a story. And so I think that, along with the influence of um, <clears throat> seeing other people, like, really wanted me to, like, really... Um, made me want to like pick up a camera it was not like there's definitely a learning curve like i'm still learning um one of my friends um actually uh brought to my attention that like you know me developing my own film is like a huge like um control of what my film comes out to look like and I didn't realize that because that's not something I've ever like been into and so my friend brought that to my attention and then also my little brother who's in high school he's now learning to use the dark room and develop film and so I think that's my next step when it comes to my growth in that field of film photography to be able to kind of take more control of like the story that I'm telling through how my film is developed. Okay. And what's one of the biggest things that you've learned from doing photography at this point? This is going to sound super corny, but the actual like focus of your lens um, has a huge, um, plays a huge role in storytelling like 
being able to place your subject without moving them, but through your lens, place your subject in um, if you want them to be seen or not, or what you want to bring out in the photo, what is what you want your viewer to focus on. That has been like something that I didn't really like, I kind of took uh, for granted, but as I've, even when I got up to my SLR and using that where I can like adjust it myself and learning to adjust myself, um, that has been like very cool to be able to do. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a tough field. So um, I can appreciate that. I don't think I've heard that before um, in terms of, you know, what you just said with the lens. So do you see yourself profiting profiting more off of um, photography because I know there's a lot that comes with it when you're you know getting a client there may be a certain expectation what was that first experience like you did say um, you said something along the lines of it not going you know you, you learned some things from that but um, yeah can you talk about that for any of uh, the aspiring photographers out there so I think a lot of people don't completely um understand what film entails and that you only have but so much to shoot like it's not like digital where you could just take like a bunch of shots and then go back and edit and pick your favorite ones like you have to be very intentional it's not a process that can be rushed and um I think like I, I feel like I was very nervous because I was like, okay, I can only promise you 10 photos. That's what I said at the at the outset. I was like, I can only promise you 10 photos um, because, you know, film is like hit or miss. But those 10 photos are going to be like beautiful. I can promise you 10 beautiful photos. So um, some of them came out blurry. I think my biggest thing is like working my way up to saying, yes, I can promise you 10 photos. And then also like maybe five that are um, like, okay. And then the rest, like you can be okay with it and like it not be like, they're still salvageable type of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say 10 photos with like, it's like a ratio. So I say I have two rolls of film. They usually have like, um, let's say they have like 36. Being able to have 36 photos from one fo roll of film. Um, uh, so if I have two of those, I can promise like 10. <laughs> sometimes. And sometimes more. <laughs> And then the more rolls I have, which rolls are expensive, the more photos I can promise. And that's kind of how I've been doing it. But I've also been learning with that. Um, so I, I kind of like, you know, I was actually, I didn't reach out. Like this person reached out to me and I was surprised that they even wanted me. Like they trusted me with something that like important. And yeah. so- um that was like that was that felt like an honor honestly and i appreciate them for being able to trust me with that um but it's not for everybody film like for like especially specialty events like weddings baby showers whatever like you have to really want your photos to look like that because i think a lot of people expect digital photos yeah and they look completely different right so that was i have a lot to learn still um even how like i price myself because i i don't just like throw a slap a filter on something like i go into lightroom and i edit all my photos um uh color grade all my photos like all of that um and i don't give out raw photos either cuz we don't do that. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> so um, I feel like also how I like price myself, like not 
undervaluing myself, but at the same time finding the balance because I don't have that experience under my belt like fully. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely a lot to learn still, but it is something I I decided that like okay, this is something I want to do. Like I would not mind shooting a wedding come end of this year if yeah. I you know work towards it. Okay. So let me, let me say this. So if I'm somebody, um, and you're, and you want to get some practice in and like, uh, what, what would I have to do if I'm down there in the DMV area? And I say, Hey, if I, if I buy however much the film costs, can you like take my pictures if you just wanted to get some practice in, or are you like taking clients right now? No, I'm absolutely down for practice. Like even with my friends, like I'm still building my portfolio Mm -hmm. and I completely understand where I'm at as like still being able to learn. The only, I wouldn't reach out to anybody at this point. Like I wouldn't do any like um, reaching out to people like, Hey, like I see that. Do you want me to? No, Mm -hmm. I would, I would um, honestly, I'm not going to lie. Even when this person asked me to like take the picture, I was like, I'll take it for free. I'm like, oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because you know, I'm still learning. But like, um, yeah, like I if somebody's in the DMV and they want to take pictures with me, like they can just hit me up, give me a date. If they want to bring the film, they can. Um, I know what film I like to shoot with. And um, so if they want to give me money towards the film, that's fine. But also, like, I love, like, I love taking pictures of people. I love, um, like, even when I was in Atlanta, like, I made them. I don't know if you saw those portraits I posted. I made them yeah. take those photos. <laughs> I was like, go stand over there. We're taking pictures right mm-hmm. now. So um, I love taking pictures. Like, it's something that I love to do. So um, it's not really something that I feel like, unless it's like, you know, I'm not going to be, you can't be down here like, oh, yeah, it's my anniversary. Go, come on, take yeah. these pictures for free. <laughs> right. But, you know, I'm so down to, like, practice and, um, you know, shoot with anybody who's willing to. I love different people, different faces. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw this out here. If anybody sees this and wants to shoot with Zaharia, at least ask how much the film costs. And, you know, (laughs) just out of kindness, you know, in return, you're going to get five to ten good pictures back. So and and these these pictures are timeless, y'all. So um, and it has a vintage look. So at least and if you can't afford the film, if you can't afford however much the film costs, throw something, you know, you know what I mean, y'all just just stuff ain't cheap i know that as a as a creator myself stuff ain't cheap so thank you for telling your photography story and you know what i have one more question as well and i think you might have given the answer but just to get a definitive um answer on this is it mainly people you like to shoot or uh or there's something else that you like to shoot as well um so when i was in new york i did a lot of both and I kind of, I, I love colors. Like I love colors. And when I see vibrant colors, like Ultramax is probably my favorite film to shoot on. And cause it brings out really vivid and beautiful colors. And so I was shooting on that when I was in New York in like August. And so I definitely like scenes, scenery, but portraits are probably my favorite cause I love like, I mean, it's really like Jehovah is the artist at the end of the day when it comes to our faces and how you're built. And I'm just capturing that. And I I feel like I I see beauty in everybody. Um, I'm not the best at painting portraits, but I feel like me making up for that is taking photos of people's portraits so i love i love shooting people's faces and even when they're not looking um yeah okay 
And uh, perfect segue. Thank you. You're setting these things up perfectly Um, (laughs) because you did talk about painting portraits and that you can compensate for uh, maybe a lack of a certain skill in painting portraits. But something that I had no clue of before about, you know, 50 minutes ago is that you do just general art. Is that the case? Yeah. All right. So what all do you do? So I am a self-proclaimed mixed media artist. So um, I have kind of gotten into, okay, so I only, I kind of have my own little like signature, I guess I'm, I'm developing. I only paint on wood canvases. I don't know why. I just, well, I do know why. <laughs> it's just, um, it's very organic. And I like how, I like how the paint, goes onto the wood canvas um, stretch canvas can be very porous and like you can see the imperfections in the canvas in the holes um especially based on the quality of it because sometimes you have like really good stretch canvas but i still prefer wood and so i do a lot of paintings i love to portray right now i don't know if i should be saying this but okay i will I'm working on a series because my goal is to have a solo show. I've been in a few like community shows at galleries, but I have uh, a goal to have my own solo show by the end of this year. And I'm trying to be careful about how I explain this because it may turn into something completely different Mm -hmm. later. But um, I I like to paint um, people that look like me and um, kind of like without any context. I feel like, unfortunately, when it comes to Black art, there has to be some type of narrative of strength or oppression or, um, you know, it has it has it it's it's got to be heavy a lot of times especially like those um paintings that are portrayed in museums like and i feel like unfortunately not to get too deep into it like certain other artists of different races have that liberty to kind of just paint everyday life and that is not a huge huge thing um within black art There's always some type of, from what I've seen, because there is a lot of artists who kind of just, you know, they paint without a a narrative. They paint just to, just to be seen. Mm -hmm. And I, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. I just, I, I want to be seen within my paintings and I want others to see themselves without any trauma or any type of like heavy narrative weighing upon it just it just it to be like just letting it be you know just the beauty of being yourself and living your life without any deep context to it because that can be weighing so that's my biggest thing um and hopefully like i accomplish that by the end of the year but you know life <laughs> that that was good that was that was thought provoking because um i would be a liar if i said i was into the fine arts like that i've been to museums um as time as i've gotten older i've become more of a recluse i just like to stay in the crib but um the whole thing that you were talking about with like you know uh black art ha- always having a heavy narrative um that's not something that i would have really known and when you said that i thought of that classic picture of you know the woman sitting on the bed you know her like her shoulder is high and that is a beautiful piece of art and i think it is very much relatable blue monday i love that piece that's what it's called blue monday thank Mm -hmm. you this is why you're here she knows what she's talking about so um so something like that uh that's really the first thing that comes to my head but something else that you said reminded me of um the first track off of the uh common album b and the last line that he says the presence is a the present is a gift 
and I just want to be. So it's like you're creating art um, off of the gift of the present. Whatever is going on in the present, it doesn't have to be oppression. It doesn't have to be I'm the strongest person in the world. It's just it's just what it is. So um, I'm looking forward to your art, too. I haven't seen a lick of art from you. So um, <laughs> eventually I'll see it. But just you you talk a good game. So I believe your art is really good. So thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you. It, I feel like a lot of times I do share my art. I just don't say that it's mine. Mm. So you probably have to do some like... <laughs> Like, I wasn't like paying attention mystery. well enough. No, gotcha. it's not. Okay. So uh, forget my little monologue. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to say about your art? So um, I had to Google stretch canvas as you were talking. Um, so when did this start? Because we got a history on the podcast, um, on the photography, but how far back does your um, art go? Um. Since being a little girl, okay. um, my aunt on my dad's side and my uncle on my mom's side influenced a lot of that because they are artists themselves. Um, they don't practice as much now, but like, I feel like I'm very much a visual person and I get influenced a lot by my surroundings and my environment. And so um, through that, like, I was just inspired to I, I'm very much a person like oh I can do that and so yes I can do that but with that comes practice and um determination so um I I feel like also my parents have always like influ um supported my artistry and wanting to do that um so yeah I mean um it started at a young age. I really, really took it seriously in high school. I was in AP art. Um, it's not that, looking back at that, um, I try not to like judge myself because I know like that's what I could produce at that maturity and with that level of skill that I had. Um, and I'll probably look back at my art and feel that way um, in 10 years, who knows. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's kind of like always been there. It's always been a part of me, even if other people didn't know about it. Um, okay. So being a creator, um, we talked about the podcast. We talked about photography, um, film at that, not digital. Uh, we talked about your art. Uh, you are someone who can get influenced and, and want to go get it. And I, I can tell that you kind of do your due diligence at, uh, you know, learning things and um, attacking things and, you know, just getting at it. So what is next from here on um, with all of your endeavors? You did touch on some of them, but just to put a stamp on it. Um, I, I do want to, like, showcase my art. Um. I, I feel like I want to be more consistent and get to a level of like, I think a lot of times what people don't talk about is the val like artist validation, um, the validation of other people. And honestly, I'm kind of back and forth between that because it's really who validates my art because I'm not gonna lie, being in Laurel, um, well, not even just Laurel, but um, in Maryland, like the shows that I have participated in, like the people that I have um, been in artist shows with are like all old retired white women. And um, I've appreciated their opinion and I absolutely feel like it's valid, but is it an opinion that I want? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. It's the I don't know if it's the validation I even want. I want the validation um, of the people my art looks like. It's mm -hmm. just that simple. <laughs> I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna be like. Oh well, no. <laughs> um, so I, I think I want to not even just validation in the sense of like um, 
oh, like, I think this is good. But like, oh, this resonates with me. I understand this. Like, I understand where you're coming from. I, I, I feel this. Like, I feel what you're trying to portray. Like, and I think that is really what I want. Um, it, sound, it sounds kind of like, you know, ooh, a little bit like, you know, oh, that's so deep. But it, that's like literally all that I want um, to be able to reach people like me, um, to be able to um, be understood within my art because that's a big thing for artists. Um, and I think also I have a little third thing I'm working on. I, I love music, but I can't sing. And I've tried to play a few instruments <laughs> and that hasn't worked. So I'm really getting into like um, mixing and DJing. Um, and so I'm hoping to like be able to like kind of showcase all those things together when I feel ready. Um, but yeah, that's, it's not much. It's really, I'm really taking back again. So going back to like me being um, content with the present and not doing too much and not putting too much on my plate. I'm, I'm really trying to take things like slow and simple and um, kind of just not give more than I have. Um, so really like, you know, being okay with, if I produce five pieces by the end of this year, I'll be okay because it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot. So um, yeah. So, well, it seems like you keep yourself you know, pre pretty busy outside of, you know, secular work, your spiritual obligations, um, and then all of your creative duties. Um, you're a daughter, you're a friend to people. So it, it's a lot on your plate. So um, I wanted to ask this question about the uh, the validation as well. And you being in the, the city, the area that you're in, um, has that contributed to that validation you may be looking for because if you're going to new york you're down there in atlanta uh being around uh creative people who may be more like yourself has that contributed to the validation you're looking for or you would I, like i don't want to make you sound like you're like you know, searching for validation or like, but yeah no i think i mean isn't everybody like searching for a form of validation like i'm not afraid to say that yes i am looking for in a in a in a way validation yeah i'm not gonna lie um like people like you and peas and dev um and there's a few other guys that i've just followed up with some sisters like um who have like i i'm not at all trying to make you sound old <laughs> but have the maturity under their belt and have experience like their validation is very important to me um because they kind of are where I want to be um you guys like have inspired me a lot I guess and um I think it's more so like and obviously there are people my age who think the same as me and I am searching for those people. Um, there's this other, um, I don't know if you met her probably at one of the other pop-ups, but Shay from Brooklyn, she's a beautiful artist. And I, I've only really gotten to like sit down with her once, but like, the way she thinks and her art and how beautiful of a person she is um like i will like people like her really inspire me and their validation is very important to me so um i'm kind of just name dropping but <laughs> yeah <Okay>. like <laughs> i feel like um yeah that's that's very important to me i think people who have i'm not gonna lie i think with 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 age comes um, the appreciation of quality, um, which not a lot of people at my age have. And so maybe that's why that age group and older is really important to me because they do appreciate the quality over the quantity or the flashiness of something. But like, 
the time that something took or the meaning behind it, no matter how chaotic or simple it is. Um, so, yeah. Got you. And I now I haven't met the Shea artist. Um, I do follow them on Instagram and I've seen like their earrings and all that stuff. Pretty talented sister. So um, I always keep my eye out, you know, to find people to interview and stuff like that. So shout out to her, too. So um, you said some good stuff. Um, I think I know when I was 20, um, even 21, I was still finding I was still like trying to figure it out. I was like going to school. I was, you know, getting into the career that I that I have today. So um, even when I was 18 and started getting a little bit of money working my first job, it was like H&M, fast fashion, so on and so forth. So being able to um, recognize the quality over quantity aspect of things um, is it's smart. It's smart, to, you know, just like the Watchtower say in, in, in terms of like faith and working on uh, the fruitages of the spirit to start today. So it goes on with everything else in life. You know, you want to save money, start today. You want to do quality over quantity, start today. So you're getting, you're off to a good start. Put it that way. Thank you. So, um, that's it for me. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, was there anything that I missed or that you wanted to say? Anything that you wanted to uh, just throw in there, a tidbit, a shout out, anything? No, I feel like I shouted out a bunch of people <laughs> during the <laughs> podcast. But um, no, thank you for this opportunity. Like I, I usually am on the other side of this, so it was nice to like be the one who was inquired. Um, but yeah, this was fun. So thank you so much, um, Zaharia. Thank you for being on the show, uh, straight from the DMV. Uh, this is the Cool Ham Podcast. Check out something about your 20s. Um, until there's a new episode, you can check out these episodes. It has other people who are uh, in their 20s talking about their experiences. Um, it's really good. Check it out. And uh, check out her art. Follow her on Instagram. Um, all that. And this is the Cool all Ham the Podcast. All the pages. All the pages. <laughs> all the pages. And uh, that's it. Cool Ham Podcast, something you got to deal with. Easy. And that's it. <laughs>